Oh man, it is uh, great to be here and worship uh, with you this morning. If you have a Bible, open to uh, Judges chapter uh, 16. We'll spend some time there today. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's some in the back and you'll want to get those. We just want you to be in God's word as much as possible. Um, and we believe that it's true. So we've, we've been spending the last nine weeks in uh, the book, the seventh book of the Bible, the book of Judges. And the book of Judges starts out with the uh, children of Israel who, who have been brought out of slavery in Egypt by a guy named Moses. And they went to the desert, got the Ten Commandments, and then they were taken from the desert to the promised land by a guy named Joshua. And now they're supposed to be able to take hold of the promises of God by taking the promised land. They're, they're supposed to take hold of what God has in store for them but they failed to. You see, it's like God sent them to the store for milk and honey, and they got in the door and got distracted by the candy aisle. Does that happen to anybody in the room ever? Yeah. And, and they started to look at the candy aisle, and they said, well, I think I'll take a little bit of that. And before you know it, they're nibbling and dabbling in things that they shouldn't be, and, and they're letting go of what God had in store for them. Instead of living in obedience to God and living by his instructions, they began to dabble in the cultural norms around them and worshiping the gods of the people around them. And that began a cycle of ever darkening destruction for God's people of Israel. What should have been a time of victory as they you know, celebrated this promised land and everything God had in store for them and all the goodness, instead of it being a time of victory, this becomes a time of disobedience, defeat, and devastation, desperation for God's people. But in the midst of their lostness, because God, who is not like me, and I'm guessing not like you, continues to forgive over and over and over again. And he delivers his people from the ravages of the people around them, and he delivers them so that they can take another shot at this. And we've been looking at these unlikely individuals uh, in this book of Judges. There are people who, who are called judges, but the better word we've discovered is deliverer. They're not like a judge, like Judge Judy or Judge Wapner or somebody like that. They're, they're deliverers, people who are bringing God, uh, God's people out of bondage and into a better place. And, and so we, we have seen that some of these Old Testament characters that we have thought all of this time you know, or we're taught in Sunday school that we're heroes, are pretty messed up people. I mean, these guys sin in like spectacular ways. Not, not, not just kind of little sins. These guys sin big time when they do it. They just like go all in. And, and, what we, and, and, and that shouldn't surprise us. In fact, the good news this morning is that should encourage us. Recognizing that even in our own mistakes and sinfulness, we have a God who wants to deliver us and who wants good for us. And despite ourselves, God's saying, hey, I want what's best for you. And God continues to come after us and chase after us. These stories are about a God who, does, who, who can and does accomplish all of his plans and all of his purposes despite what you and I will do. And we are constantly people like these people who are living in rebellion against God, but we have a God who will constantly make his plans and purposes prevail, despite whether or not we cooperate with him. And last week, we began our look at the last of these deliverers, the last judge in the book of Judges, and it's Israel's super strong man. What was his name? Samson. How many of you guys remember Samson from Sunday school? How many Sunday school goers got in the house? Okay, yeah, and we learned all kinds of things about Samson. And, and he was kind of, he, we were taught that he was kind of this big Bible hero, this big, strong, muscular guy who could do all kinds of things. <coughs> Excuse me. And many of us, though, last week began to see a side of Samson that we weren't taught in Sunday school. In fact, as we've been working through the book of Judges, I'm starting to realize that some of my early on Sunday school teachers, they conveniently left out parts of the Bible, okay? That, that you know, it, it, it's kind of like a parent who, you know, if you're a parent and, and all of a sudden something's coming up in a movie, right, that you're thinking, oh man, my kids shouldn't see that, what do we do? 
Yeah, we've hit, we hit fast forward, right? And I think a lot of our Sunday school teachers maybe hit the fast forward button because they're like, ooh, we don't need our kids to hear or read that about Samson, okay? Because this guy did some crazy, crazy stuff. It, it reminds me of the fact that, I mean, oftentimes we try to sterilize the stories in the Bible. And as we've been going through the book of Judges, we've been saying, hey, we're, we're not here to sterilize or kind of tame it down. We're, we're here to look at the reality that God uses broken people. It reminds me of the, the fact that, um, that uh, years back, um, uh, my wife w- would collect these little, um, these little figurines. Um, does it, any, anybody, anybody know what this is? What, what, what is this? <laughs> I only hear women's voices. Yeah, yeah. So it's the precious moments, right? Precious moments. And um, uh, my wife collected these, and they came out with, I'll, I'll set it right there so you can in, enjoy that this morning. Um, well, they came out with a series of precious moments that were about the Bible stories. You know, this one is the story of, of Daniel and the lion's den. I mean, look how ferocious that man-eating lion is, right? <coughs> and... Uh, And look, I mean, there's bones down there, obviously, from the people who got ravaged and torn apart by that dreadful lion, right? I mean, it it just shows, I mean, we try to kind of cleanse and kind of sterilize the stories of the Bible. So a friend of mine, a youth pastor friend of mine, we used to always laugh about this. We used to always say, you know, they need to come out with a line of these things called the not-so-precious moments of the Bible, Right? And, uh, and the book of Judges would be a prime place to come up with little figurines for the not-so-precious moments. Um, in fact, some people had actually drawn some of these up. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and it was, uh, like, for instance, could you imagine a figurine of the Judge Jail? Remember, she drove the tent peg through the head of the guy. Wouldn't that make a great precious, not-so-precious moments? You know, you could kind of display that in the curio cabinet. You know, things like, or Ehud, who had his little double-edged sword and stabbed it through the big guy and it poked out his back and all that kind of stuff. I mean, wouldn't that make a great figurine or something like that, right? I mean, there's all these not-so-precious moments through the book of Judges, and we're reminded that, that, God's, that God's working with people who, who aren't so sterile, who aren't so perfect, who there's some crazy stuff that happens. The last week, we, we started to learn some new things about Uh, the life of Samson. We learned that Samson had a miraculous birth. He was promised by an angel of God to his parents and told prior to his birth that he was going going to be a child who had special power and special even physical strength so that he could defeat and destroy the Philistines who were holding God's people in bondage. Then we were also told that Samson's great power was connected to living out a special vow called a Nazarite vow. You can go read Numbers chapter 6. Okay, for those of you who are interested, number six, about what that vow was all about. And he had to follow special rules. Like he could not, he wasn't allowed to have anything that had anything to do with grapes. Okay, from raisins to Chardonnay, he had to stay away. Okay, and, and then he, he couldn't have, a, he, he couldn't touch anything that was dead. And he couldn't, um, he couldn't ever have his hair cut. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, okay, so stay away from grapes, from cemeteries, and from barbershops, and you're okay, right? I mean, this doesn't sound like it's a too difficult of a task, but then we discover that Samson has this kind of wild side, this rebellious streak in him. Anybody in here kind of have a rebellious streak in them? No elbowing the person next to you, okay? Yeah. I mean, we all, even if we don't actually do it, there might be in most of us a rebellious attitude or some thoughts that go through our head. We're thinking, hey, it'd be nice to, or what if I could? And we have this rebellious attitude. Now, Samson had not only this wild side and rebellious attitude, he had a weakness. We discovered last week that his weakness was what? Women. Yeah. Like many of the guys. Now, guys, you need to pay special attention to the life of Samson, okay? He had, he had this weakness uh, for women. We read in Judges chapter 13, verse 25, it says when Samson was young, it says, the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Unfortunately, the Holy Spirit wasn't the only thing that motivated Samson to action. Women voted, motivated Samson into action. But God had a purpose. God had a purpose for Samson's life. His main purpose, God's main purpose for Samson's life was to destroy the Philistines. 
And God's plans and purposes, as we will see, will prevail with or without Samson's cooperation. And so let's dive into chapter 16 as we see that once again, Samson starts to slip into this path of disobedience and his life begins to reflect the cycle of destruction that not only Samson's life, but the whole nation of Israel is caught up in. So it starts off in verse 1 where we see Samson's disobedience. It says, one day Samson went to Gaza, one of the main capitals of the Philistines. He says, where he saw a prostitute... And he went in to spend the night with her. So there's no precious moments about that, right? No figurines for that story. So the people of Gaza were told, hey, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night (coughs) at the city gates. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn we will kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and he took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and he tore them loose, bar and all, and he lifted them to his shoulders and he carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, what you need to understand, we have a gentleman from our church family here. Um, Aaron Burke, who is an archaeologist, and I was talking to Aaron about this, and, and it, I was saying, like, how, how big might these city gates be? Because he actually did some archaeology in this area of the world um, back about this time. And he said, well, there was these pedestrian gates, and then there was the main city gates that were probably still only, you know, maybe wide enough for a big cart and some horses and stuff to get through. Either way, but, but you got to understand that these gates were there to keep the city secure and to keep out the enemy. So every night they would lock up the the gates of the city so no one could get in, okay? So everyone could sleep in peace, okay? But no one could get out either. And so uh, Samson, you know, he gets up in the middle of the night, starts to go out, the city gates are locked, so what does he do? He just rips them off their hinges, puts them on his shoulders, and the mountain that they're talking about, the hill that, that, that says he took these days to, is literally 40 miles away. 40 miles. So it could have been a while. Okay, it took him a while. But, but these gates that were supposed to provide safety for the city that they depended on, that they thought would be their form of safety, Samson just rips them off and takes them with him and just heads on out and leaves them on the top of this hill. So they either had to build new ones or go retrieve their gates, Right? And so he takes them all the way away. Now, then what happens, I mean, I don't know about you, but did did you notice anything unusual or different about this special feat that Samson performed? See, I have a feeling that Samson starts to think that he can kind of do anything he wants, whenever he wants, wherever he wants, with whoever he wants, without any kind of consequences. And Samson has this great power that's a gift from God, but he lacks wisdom. He lacks discipline. And folks, great power with no wisdom is simply a lethal combination. And, and so, I mean, the more power that you get in any area of your life, the more wisdom you need to navigate things. Think about it. If you have more of any, more money, you need a little more wisdom on how to spend, right? We've all seen pictures of people who get lots of money, but they lack wisdom and it's all gone, right? I mean, then there's people who have position. They're put in position and put in position without wisdom, okay, causes chaos, okay, and you destroy people's lives. I mean, there's all kinds of things. I mean, we even know when God puts you in a place, like a place of authority, like, I mean, even parenting, you know, I mean, parenting, that's you, you need God's wisdom to help you with that. Or man, who knows what your kids might turn out like, right? And so God is continually working, and, and Samson lacks this wisdom that he needs. But, but what happened in this story, which is so different from all the other places where Samson acts, is this one little line. You see, everywhere else where Samson acts in power, there's this little phrase The Spirit of the Lord came on him powerfully. In in chapter 14, verse 6, you know, the lion jumped out of the vineyard. And it says in in 14, 6, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. And then down in verse 19 of chapter 14, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord 
uh, came powerfully upon him and he went down to Eshcon and he struck down 30 of their men. So he you know, beats up on these guys, remember, and he stole their clothes and gave them to the guys he had a bet with. And then in chapter 15, it says, um, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. And remember, that's when he grabbed the jawbone of a donkey and he says, and he killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. Every time in the past that, God, that Samson had done some big powerful act, we have this little phrase, the spirit of the Lord came on him, but not this time. It's strangely left out of this activity. It's as if the biblical author wants to tell us there's something different going on at this point in Samson's life. That what started out as Samson, you know, doing these things directed by God and under the power of God's spirit, that now all of a sudden, Samson's doing something, but he's forgetting where the power came from. And he starts to think that the power came from himself. Now, can I ask you something this morning? Is there an area in your life where God has given you something? Where God has blessed you with something. But then now, after a time, you have somehow come to believe that that thing is by your own doing. That somehow now that's that's your thing, not God's. I mean, think about it. I mean, maybe, maybe it's, it's your intellect. Maybe God gave you a great mind. And, um, and, and hey, nothing against like hard work and study and all those things, but the reality is some of you have been thinking like, well, man, but, but I've done this. You know, I studied hard, I, I learned, I did all this stuff. But where did that come from initially? For some of you, maybe it's, maybe it's your finances. Maybe, you know, you, you've got money and things like that, and you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, I worked hard. I, I did all this for myself, but... Really, who, who allowed you to do that? Who gave you the opportunities? The Bible says that it's God who gives us the opportunity to create wealth. Maybe it's your good looks, you know? Maybe the reality is you're thinking, you know, hey, that's all me, right? And, and, and I know because sometimes, you know, you, you know, there's people who just kind of think, well, hey, I, I can just, you know, my, my good looks or my, my charm or something will get me out of some situation. You think it's all you. But the reality is, who, who created you? Who actually gave you that from the first place? Maybe it is your physical strength. You, you've been relying on that all along. What is it that you're depending on and you think it's all you, but in reality, it was a gift of God from the first place and you've, you've slowly moved from thanking God for it to thinking that it's just yours. There's something like that in your life because there certainly wasn't Samson's life. God had given him this great strength, this great power. God had given him the Holy Spirit. Samson starts to take this for granted. And he starts to think that he's undefeatable. And he moves from disobedience now to defeat. Look in, in verse four, it says, sometime later, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman from the Valley of Sorek, whose name was, who is his girlfriend? Yeah, this is the one we've read about, okay? This is the one we've heard about before, Delilah. Now again, Samson is motivated not by obedience to God, but by obedience to his own lustful flesh and thinking. So what happens here in verse five, it says, the rulers of the Philistines went to her, and they said, see if you can lure him into showing the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver, which is quite a bit of money. And so Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Now, I'll give it to Delilah, okay? I'll just give it to her, man. She is not conniving. She is not sneaky or manipulative. She is just straightforward, tell me, how can I defeat you? How can I destroy your life? I mean, who says that, right? Even worse is who listens to that and keeps hanging out with that person? 
Well, I'll tell you who. Samson. Okay, because this guy's not the brightest tool in the shed. He's pretty strong. But he keeps, uh, so, so look what happens. I mean, Samson's lust, coupled with his false sense of security and thinking that he had, that the strength is just his own, he just, he doesn't even just dismiss Delilah's blatant plot, plot to destroy him. He actually kind of like toys with it and goes along with it. Samson answers in verse seven. Samson answered, if anyone ties me up with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I will become weak as any other man. I mean, Samson, again, he doesn't dismiss it. He plays along. I mean, she, he's like, you know, yeah, just, just tie me up. Tie me up. And, I mean, and he's a willing participant in having her tie him up. Now, again, I, you're thinking, why would he be such a willing participant? And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder... There's not a precious moments for that part of the story, right? It reminds me of years ago as a, as a, as a youth pastor, we'd go to all these youth events and youth retreats and stuff like that. And one night we were, we were walking down, we were staying in a hotel, we're walking down the hallway, and we used to always tell the kids, like, okay, the girls have to go and stay in the girls' room, the boys in the boys' room, right? No, you can't go in each other's room, you know, the girls are pink, the boys are blue, we don't make purple, Okay. And so we would say, um, and so, but they were sitting out in the hallway, and there's these junior high boys sitting out in the hallway with these junior high girls, and the junior high girls, the boys are letting them put makeup on them, okay? And I remember sitting there and looking at one of the boys, and I said, hey, you, get up and come with me, because your dad is going to kill me if I keep letting this happen, right? And so one of the leaders was with me, he was thinking like, asking me like, so what do you suppose is going on there? Why would these junior high boys let them do that? And I said, I told this leader, I said, never underestimate what a young junior high boy will do to let a girl touch him. Okay? Again, there's no precious moments figures for that kind of stuff. Right? But the reality is, is he's just playing along with her. Okay? The, the lust of this guy and everything else going on with him, coupled with the idea that he thinks he's above consequences, says that he can do whatever he wants. Then in verse 8 it says, Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that hadn't been uh, dried, and she tied him up. And the men hid in the room, which is all freaky anyways, okay? And she calls out to him, Samson, the Philistines are on you. He snaps the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to the flame, so the secret of his strength is not discovered. Then Delilah says to Samson, this is classic. You have made me a fool. You made a fool out of me. You lied to me. Come now. Tell me how you can be tied. Does anybody see the irony in this whole thing? It's like she's like crying now. She's like, Samson, you, you know, you, you're making a fool out of me because you won't tell me how I can destroy you. Just thinking, who needs this woman in your life, Right? I was like, this is crazy, but, but he continues to play along. Then she says, well, come on, tell me. He says, well, you know, if you get new ropes and you tie me up, and that happens, and that doesn't work. And then he starts getting, not just playing along, now he starts to get creative. And she's like, oh, tell me, Samson. She says, okay, well, if you take my braids and you weave them into a loom and you put the big weaver's rod through that whole thing, that'll take care of it. And then she says, Samson, the Philistines. And he rips that thing out of the ground and everything else, and, and nothing happens to him. And then she says to him in verse 15, she says, you, she says, how can you say you love me when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool out of me and haven't told me the secret of your strength. And then I love verse 16, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day, and check this wording out, until he was sick to death. And I'm thinking, so this guy would actually literally physically die then get nagged to death, right? I'm thinking, this is, this is like, these people are like Jerry Springer rejects, okay? It's like, this story is ridiculous. So then, but in verse 17, verse 17 is really, I think, I think one of the saddest uh, parts of the story. It says, so he told her everything. He totally get, gave in. He said, no razor's ever been used on my head he said, because I've been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. Man, that verse right there, 
That should have been Samson's incredible testimony to anybody in his life. I mean, Samson should have been able to say, yeah, this whole power thing, it's not for me. You see, from the time I was a child, I've been dedicated to God. And God's been doing all this powerful work in my life, and here's all the things that God's been able to accomplish by using his power in me. That should have been his story. This should have been an amazing testimony to the greatness and the power of God at work in the life of an individual. But it wasn't. Why? Because Samson chose to say, no, this is my own thing. This is my power. I think this power is mine to do with whatever I want. And instead of having a story that glorifies God, he used it as a story to try to glorify himself. But then when Delilah had seen that he had told her everything, she went, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back one more time, he's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands, they're ready to pay up. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called to someone, they shaved off the seven braids of his hair, and, he be, and so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Now follow the story. It's it's really sad. Verse 20. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep. And he thought, what did he think? I will go out as before and shake myself free. And then it says, but the Lord did not, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. How do you get to that place? How do you get to the place with the the source of power in your life that's as mighty as what God has done in his life? How do you get to a place where you don't even know that that's left you? Why did he think, oh, I'll just go out just like before? Because he'd he'd learned to, to rely on his own strength, his own power. Now, has there been ever been a time in your life when maybe you thought to yourself, hey, that, that won't happen to me. That might happen to other people, but that's not going to happen to me. Only to actually have it happen to you. Have you ever been in a place where you told yourself, I'll never go there. I won't be dumb enough to cross that line, only to find yourself asking the question, how in the world did I get here? You know, I've... I've always said that if the, the chairs in my office could tell stories, they would tell tons of stories about people who say that very same thing. How in the world did I get here? And usually, as we back things up, we discover that people get where they never intended to be. They get to a place where they say they would never go, and they've done things that they thought they would never do because they simply gave in one little step at a time. Because they thought, well, I can get back. If I just cross this little line, I I can get back okay. I'm strong enough to handle that. I can go with my friends and do that thing, but I'm strong enough to say no. I'm strong enough to get back. I've got enough power to, to say no to that. I can get really close to the flame without getting burned. One little look won't hurt. One little drink won't mean a thing, one little kiss, one little touch, one little lie, one little bet, one little call, one little thing won't push me over the edge because I've got it. I can get it together if I need to. One thing that you thought you had the power over or could recover from, and the reality is, is the problem really started when you began to believe that that power was yours. When all along, the power to do anything right in our lives comes from our Heavenly Father, who has a better plan and a better story for our lives if we'll let Him use us. You see, the things that God has given us, including the power and the resource and everything else in life, it really wasn't ours, it was His to begin with. He's just letting us, loaning that to us and letting us use it for His purposes. So Samson moves from this place of defeat to a place of total desperation. See, look what happens in verse 21. Then the Philistines seized him, and they gouged out his eyes. Again, there's not a precious moments for that one. 
And they took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles that before he could have just broken easily. And they sent him to grinding grain in the prison. Interesting. Remember the little story last week for those of you who are here when he, he, he killed a thousand people with the jawbone of a donkey. And then he made this little poem up for himself. He thought he was so smart. And he says, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've made donkeys out of them, right? Well, I was studying this the last couple weeks and discovered that the donkey was the preferred animal of choice for treading grain. The very thing he thought he had done to somebody else has now happened to him. I mean, what did you expect God to do in the story like this? I mean, if God is really a loving God, what did you expect God to do in this situation? See, a lot of us get kind of in this place where we think, well, if he's a loving God, he'll just bail us out. If God's truly a loving God, then when I make a mess of things, he's just going to fix it for me. Now, all of you in this room who are parents, you know that doesn't work. Because what happens when a parent continually bails their kid out? Well, you produce a generation of entitled, spoiled, rotten, brat kids who think they're the center of the universe. That's what happens. See, loving parents will actually come to a place where they let their children experience the natural consequences of their actions. But why do they do that? Why do loving parents do that? So that hopefully the kid will have a change of heart and not keep going down a path that gets them further into destruction. If you just bail them out, they'll just blindly keep going in a place that leads them towards destruction. If you will let them experience consequences, they might wake up and say, this is not a good way to go. This might be more painful than I thought it was going to be. You see, here's the reality. People somehow fool themselves into thinking that God's grace means that he's just gonna bail you out when bad things happen. See, this is a side of God's grace that we don't like to talk about a lot. See, God loves you so much that he won't just like do everything, you know, and send his son to die for you. He will let you experience pain if it means that you might wake up, repent, and get back into relationship with him. That's God's grace. That is not God like being a mean guy who's saying, you know, you're on your own or whatever. That is God saying, I love you so much that I want you to learn from your mistake. I love you so much that I will let you endure some pain in the hopes that you might turn around and ask for forgiveness and come back to me. See, some of you are in a place in your life where you're all ticked off at God because you're like, oh God, I'm in this situation and uh, why don't you bail me out? I'll tell you why he won't bail you out. Because he has this great hope He is banking on the reality that the pain in your life might cause you to actually acknowledge that you don't have it all together and you might turn and depend on him and cooperate with the story that he has for you and you'll experience actual wholeness, forgiveness, and completeness in your life. And so will we allow ourselves to realize that the power is not from us and the power is from him? And will we cooperate with his story? See, he has a better story to write in your life than you do. You go on in the story, and there's a little glimmer of hope in verse 22. It says, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. It's almost like, dun, 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 something's coming. It's like a little foreshadowing thing. And here's what it says, it says, now the, Philist- now the rulers of the Philistines, which by the way, what was God's purpose for Samson's life? Anybody remember back that far? What was his purpose? Destroy the Philistines. Now the rulers of the Philistines were assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. I got to tell you a little side story just because it's cool, okay, is the, the Philistines, years and years prior, there was this big battle 
okay, because the, the Israelites and the Philistines were constantly going at each other. And there was this one little fight where the Philistines actually captured the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, they, they captured the Ark of the Covenant and they take it back to the temple of Dagon, their god. And they set the Ark of the Covenant just across from the, the, the Dagon, okay, and, and when that happens, it says the Philistines woke up in the morning and Dagon, the statue of Dagon, had fallen on its face in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And, and we all are like, yeah, God, you go, man. Knock down that statue, right? And then it happened again and the thing finally breaks and everything else. It's like God's just showing over and over again that he's more powerful. But so we've got this situation where they're like celebrating to their, their foreign, their horrible, their really little G God. And it says in verse 25, while they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison, and he performed for them. What did that look like? He wasn't strong. He couldn't do strongman tricks anymore. He wasn't ripping telephone books in half or anything like that for him. So what was he doing? Some commentators believe that they actually just brought him out naked to totally humiliate him. To say, look, we have power over the guy who was powerful. So now we're the powerful ones. He's become some kind of like circus sideshow freak. And they drag him out. And folks, there's not a precious moment for that. It goes on and said, when they stood him along the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women, all the rulers of the Philistines were there. What was Samson's purpose again? And on the roof, there was about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Now God moves from this place of, uh, Samson moves from this place of, uh, of desperation to, he finally experiences some deliverance. Look in verse 28. Then Samson prayed to the Lord. See, remember that God will let you endure this kind of stuff, this kind of pain. Why? So that you will return to him. And Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just one more time. Let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson reached towards the two central pillars which the temple, on which the temple stood, embracing himself against him, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistine. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than he did while he was alive. And his brothers and fam- father's whole family went down and got him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshlal in the tomb of Manoah, his father. And he had led Israel for 20 years. What, what was the purpose of Samson's life? See, here, here's a couple things. Now, Samson, Samson is not an example of how to live and how to follow God. He is a picture of how not to. He's, his life is a warning for us. But Samson's life is also a demonstration of this. God's plans and his purposes will always prevail. The purpose of Samson's life was still realized. Regardless of Samson's non-cooperation with God's plan. Now, Now here's the thing. We know how the thing ended up. But here's what I want you to get in your head this morning is this. What could have Samson's life been like if he would have chosen that instead of thinking that the power was all his or he could do whatever he want or he could just kind of live his own life, what if Samson would have cooperated? See, God's plan and his purpose is going to end up the way it's supposed to end up anyways. See, the things that happen that that are different in there is whether or not we experience God's goodness in our story while we're on the way there. And the reality is, as I'm wondering, what, what would have happened if from the beginning Samson would have said, I've got this great power from the Lord I am going to dedicate my life to serving him. I'm going to do all this stuff. And again, we don't know because that didn't happen, but what could have happened What would the story have been? What would Samson's testimony have been if he would have said, instead of going my own way, I'm going to cooperate with the Lord? 
What kind of blessing would he have received? What kind of life might he have lived? And I'm guessing that this morning, in a room full of people like this, that there's a few folks in here who might need to ask themselves the same question. What would life be like if, instead of fighting God, instead of doing my own thing or thinking that I have enough strength to do life on my own, what if we lived in full cooperation with God? How might God bless our lives differently? How might the story be just a little bit different if we live in cooperation with his plans and purposes rather than thinking that we have it all figured out? And so this morning, I'm simply inviting you to do what maybe Samson should have done early on and just said, hey, I want to acknowledge that, guess what? If it's left up to me, I'll wreck it most every time. And to be able to say, Lord, guess what? And maybe you're in that place in your life. Maybe you've wrecked something in your life. Maybe you're at that place where you're experiencing consequences for making choices that have taken you down a pathway because you thought you'd be okay, you had the power, you wanted to do this, you did, and maybe you're experiencing all that, and maybe this is the point, maybe right now today is the place where you say, Man, if I would cooperate with God's plans and purposes for my life, maybe my life would be a whole lot better. Maybe if I cooperated with God, that the moments of my life would be a little more precious than painful. Just maybe. If we let God do what he really wants to do in our lives. You see, God, God made an incredible trip to the altar on your behalf. God took his only son and he brought him to the altar of the cross and he said, my plans and purposes are to have a relationship with you and I'm willing to sacrifice my son to help us get there. And maybe this morning there's someone in this room that needs to say, maybe for the very first time, I don't have the strength, I don't have the power, I don't have the wisdom, I don't have the know-how, I will wreck it every time, and I need to depend on God for guidance and direction in my life. And maybe you need to say, I need to stop pretending that I'm the Lord of my life, and I need to let God become the Lord of my life. And if you have never said, I need Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life, and I want to experience all of that that he has for me, then this morning I I, I pray that, Lord, you'll just open up your heart and your life, that you'll repent and say, hey, I can't do this, I need him. And you know, I'm going to be sitting right down here, um, and and I would love to talk to you during the songs or during communion. Feel free to just come up and chat with me. I'd love to share with you. How do you make that move? Maybe some of you, maybe some of you have, Wrecked your life, wrecked relationships, wrecked all kinds of things, wrecked your jobs, wrecked your... And you, you need to say this morning, Lord, I have wrecked it. Help me, Lord. I would rather cooperate with you and experience your goodness than keep trying to do this on my own. Maybe that's where you are this morning. Wherever you are, my prayer this morning is that while we take communion that represents God's sacrifice on our behalf, that you might come to a place of saying... God, I recognize that you are king of kings and lord of lords. That your plans and your purposes will always prevail and I would rather cooperate you than fight against you. That Lord, I would love for you to come in and redeem and restore the things that I've broken in my life. And Father, I wanna come to you this morning. And maybe you need to come to that altar this morning and lay down your pride And lay down all the stuff you've been depending on. And lay down your own strength and your own power and all of your own wisdom. And say, Lord, I need what you've got rather than what I have. And would you use this time this morning as we celebrate Christ's sacrifice for us to do just that. To come to him. 
because here's what I know about him. He will always, always forgive. He will always desire to restore and deliver you out of the wreck and the bondage of the places that you put yourself. He's a good God and he loves you with all of his heart. Would you respond to him and say, Lord, I want to cooperate with you today. And if that's where you're at, I'd love to talk to you more about it because we want you to experience a different story. A story of full cooperation with the God who has everything everything for you and wants your best. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, you're so good. Father, we recognize this morning that um, we are powerless to make everything happen on our own. We recognize that only you are truly good and that we need your guidance and your direction and your strength and your power to live the story that you have for us and we would rather have that than the story we might write for ourselves thinking that we've got it together. So Lord, would you work in our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit this morning and help us to move in your direction. Father, my prayer is for that each person in this room, they would see where they stand in relationship to you this morning. If they need, Father, to repent and get things right, if they need to give up, come to the altar and lay down something that's holding them back, that, Father, right now your spirit would move them to do that. And if there's someone here this morning, Father, that needs to say, I need Jesus as Lord of my life because I, the story I'm writing is a mess and I need Jesus to come and straighten that story out, and that, Father, I want an eternity with you, God. Then, then, Father, I pray that that person would be moved by your Holy Spirit to move. To allow you to be who you truly are, Lord of our lives. The King of heaven. The one who has everything good in store for us. We love you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name.